welcome to the American Museum of Tort Law's continuing video series on topics of interest with thought leaders from around the country. Our guest today is Bruce Fine, the internationally renowned constitutional lawyer, scholar, and author. Bruce, who went to a law school, you've probably heard of it, it's called Harvard, where he graduated with honors in 1972, has had a distinguished career. He served as, and was appointed to serve as research director for the House Republicans on the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran from 1986 to 87, and served thereafter as General Counsel of the Federal Communications Commission, oh, previously, from 1983 to 1984. In 1981 and 1982, Mr. Fine served as Associate Deputy Attorney General in the U.S. Department of Justice and supervised the department's litigation as well as vetting candidates for the federal judiciary. He has served as a visiting scholar for constitutional studies at the Heritage Foundation, as an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and has taught as an adjunct professor at George Washington University in Washington, DC. He's regularly on television and radio, appearing on MSNBC, Fox News, C-SPAN, BBC, Reuters, and National Public Radio. It is a great pleasure to have with us today uh, just a, a brilliant scholar and thought leader, Bruce Fine. Bruce, welcome. Thank you, Richard. Now, let me... Uh, let, me let me just volunteer for the audience uh, something that I picked up from uh, the great philosopher Samuel Johnson. And in making plaudits and introductions, uh, man is not under oath. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Well, in any event, Bruce is with us today because we have two topics that we want to take up. The first is the recent spate of executive orders signed by President Trump and the overgrowth, as it were, of the use of executive orders in general. The rebalancing, as it were, of power between the Congress and the presidency. The second topic that we'd like to discuss is President Trump's liability, if any, for the false and fraudulent statements he has made about the COVID-19 pandemic. Statements ranging from using bleach or light to cure it, to that it will go away on its own, to masks are not necessary. And the question becomes whether he might be exposed to some personal liability for these fraudulent representations. So Bruce, let me start with the first subject. Last Saturday, President Trump signed four documents characterized first as executive orders, then later as memoranda, and ultimately may not matter what they're called, but they were documents that really attempt to rejigger and take away from Congress the power of the purse by changing tax law and uh, payment law. Tell us about this. Why is this an issue? Uh, it's an issue, uh, Richard, because our birth certificate is the United States Constitution. And uh, we have to comply with constitutional order and processes if we are to retain our liberties. Uh, that is indispensable. And the Constitution in Article I uh, grants all legislative powers created by the Constitution to the Congress of the United States. Uh, the executive branch has no power to legislate. Uh, and what the president did, and unfortunately it's not the first time presidents have done this, is he decided because Congress would not do his bidding on what he wanted a new COVID-19 legislation to look like, he would simply act unilaterally in lieu of Congress uh, without any constitutional authority uh, to defer payment of payroll taxes, which fund Social Security and Medicare, uh, to spend money that had been appropriated for natural disasters uh, in order to support unemployment uh, compensation payments to those laid off because of COVID-19. Uh, he decreed in a less aggressive way uh, that all of the uh, houses in which mortgages are held or insured by the federal government uh, he would put some kind of moratorium or 
uh, discussion of for of uh, withholding eviction uh, during the pendency of the pandemic. And lastly, uh, he stated that the federal student loan program uh, would be examined to determine whether or not loan payments could be uh, deferred in some respect or another. But the two most important, the power of the person, the power of taxation. Uh, Congress did not authorize, Congress did not vote to defer the collection of the tax payments which fund Medicare and Social Security. Congress did not vote that the monies appropriated for FEMA, natural disasters, should be spent on unemployment compensation. Uh, Congress could take those measures. Uh, that's why they exist. Their decisions of a legislative branch to execute policy and President Trump simply usurped them. Now, why is this important beyond the specifics of the case? Many will say, well, Congress was in gridlock. These aren't dramatic changes. After all, we have a budget of $5 trillion annually. Taxes raised are huge. This is a small amount. Uh, the reason why it's much more important than that is the precedent. In principle, if the president can steal money from FEMA and spend it for something he wants, it's also a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act, he could take it from any institution and decide to use it for whatever purpose he thought would be politically advantageous. If the president can defer payment of payroll taxes, could he defer payment of income taxes for all the billionaires that are his friends and supporters? And where's the principle that prevents him from deferring any tax at any time for what any length of period uh, on his say so alone? So you cannot cabin the precedent. Uh, to borrow from Justice Jackson, it lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for use by any president who wants to destroy our constitutional order. Is this something new? I mean, is this a, a constitutional crisis or is this more of the same from executive orders from prior administrations? Um, I think it's both. Uh, certainly executive orders are not new. Uh, executive orders began to emerge when we, I say, uh, transformed ourselves from a republic to an empire where the goal was government power, not liberty. And presidents have been issuing executive orders regularly uh, as surrogates for legislation. Uh, even during something that was viewed as laudable in the civil rights years when it was difficult to get civil rights legislation enacted, presidents were issuing executive orders just creating a civil rights law for federal contractors. Um, instead of working with Congress, which ultimately succeeded in the 64 Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. Uh, and President Obama himself also, in my judgment, uh, when he decided, first he said that he needed immigration law statutory changes uh, to permit many of those that now known as DACA uh, children uh, to be uh, regularized, if you will, uh, as legal residents of the United States. And then frustrated, he just decided on his own, uh, he would change it. And now we have Trump changing it back the other way. But these are issues that need to be debated in Congress. We can never uh, say that the ends justify the means. In many respects, the Constitution stands for the principle that the means are the ends. There are ways to do things, just as we respect due process, Richard. Even if we think someone's guilty, uh, we see Lee Harvey Oswald killed by Jack Ruby on television. He still gets a trial. You don't say, well, we all know he's guilty, therefore we sentence him to prison. And the reasons is because government is susceptible to overreaching and abuse. And if it really is a wise decision, there's no reason why members of Congress wouldn't come around and agree because they have no desire to run the United States off of a cliff uh, and they're up to reelection as the president is. And if the people of the United States believe that the system is not working properly, they can amend the constitution. It's been done 28 times. Uh, it was done with civil war amendments. It was done to enfranchise women. Uh, and that's the way in which change comes about if it's thought the existing processes are dysfunctional. But it's not just done unilaterally by the stroke of a presidential pen. Well, that leads to my next question. Where is Congress 
why, where is Congress? What's going on here? Well, Congress has turned, I, I oftentimes describe it as either the invertebrate branch or the inkblot. Um, Congress, because it has become so partisan, it no longer defends the institutional prerogatives, the House and the Senate or the two collectively. Uh, if the Republicans have a president in the White House, they'll let the president run roughshod over the Constitution. When President uh, George W. Bush occupied the White House, the Republicans didn't issue a single subpoena. Do whatever you want, including illegal wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and otherwise. When Democrats are in the White House, it's the same thing. There's no oversight. Very, we can't embarrass the president. And so because the members of Congress, Richard, now believe their highest loyalty is to the party as opposed to the Constitution and the institution. It's easy for the president to get one third of one branch, which is all he needs to prevent an override, if you will, of his veto, uh, to operate the government unilaterally. You could ask, but why would somebody want to be a member of Congress if they're really reduced you know, to being virtually indentured servants of the president? And I think that it w we have a real, real difficulty in attracting persons of stature to wish to occupy Congress because itself is in many respects a, uh, a, a mini, if you will, tyranny. Beginning with Newt Gingrich's speakership mm -hmm. in the early 1990s, he basically lobotomized Congress, slashed office salaries, concentrated all the power in the House Speaker. Uh, and the chairman of committees and the members have virtually no power to decide what bills get voted on, what rules apply in voting on those bills. It's all top down. And it's remained the same through his successors, including Nancy Pelosi. Uh, the result is we basically have a government run by the president, the Speaker of the House and the president or the majority leader of the Senate. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be this way, Richard. The members have the authority to change the rules by majority vote. And you figure, hey, you got 435 members in the House, 100 in the Senate. You know, the majority of them don't have any power. Why don't they collectively unify and change the rules? It was done about 100 years ago, and it's called Uncle Joe Cannon was the House Speaker. And uh, he was thrown out of uh, that, uh, that powerful position by George Norris and some Democrats. Uh, but we don't have the, the character and the strength of uh, a vision in our members to do anything. Uh, and it's very difficult to know how do you deal with an institution that doesn't want to exercise its powers? It believes, well, if I don't vote on anything, there'll be nothing criticized. You know, that's kind of the attitude there. Yeah, I just, I'm wondering where will the, the change come from? I mean, the entrenched leadership, Nancy Pelosi, Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, it would seem to me, are in no great hurry to relinquish the re reins of power. So it has to come from the members of Congress. Where are they? Why are they not interested in doing that? I don't know, because Richard, I have gone up there myself, I tried to organize uh, this. Uh, I, I helped uh, get rid of uh, Speaker Boehner. Uh, was with a, 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 but uh, you know, it didn't require a complete overhaul of the rules but uh, Boehner was very unpopular and even among the Republicans. Uh, and uh, there was a motion to vacate introduced by Mark Meadows that I helped draft. And ultimately Boehner did vacate even before the vote. Uh, but, and, and the other thing that most members don't understand is that because the House has only a two year lifespan, all of the rules are open. They're open for uh, a reconsideration at the beginning of every Congress. It's not like they carry over. Says, hey, here's your chance. Go rewrite the rules beforehand and say, here they are. Don't let Nancy Pelosi or whoever it is, I don't want to pick on her. If it was a man who was the, the speaker of the Republican, they'd be doing the same thing. Uh, and write the rules. You're starting with a clean slate every two years. Yeah. You don't have to borrow these precedents over. Uh, but th there's very, very little interest. I mean, the last time around, I remember... I think there was um, 2016 when Paul Ryan was there and I was speaking with Congressman Massey and he said, well, he's from Kentucky. Um, he's disliked by Trump. Uh, he's someone, I, you might call him a maverick. He's very brilliant, an MIT grad, 
had invented patents by the time he graduated. And he said he had maybe 20 votes he had who were going to vote against Paul Ryan because he was simply a second edition of Newt Gingrich when it came to concentrating power on the leadership. And when it came time to vote, the only one who cast a vote against Paul Ryan was Thomas Massey. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, because you can buy them off. You say, well, look, I'll give you this chairmanship. I'll give you that committee. I'll let you, I'll, I'll contribute to your campaign. And I say, the kinds of characters who we, we, we have running for office simply can't resist that temptation. They are very shallow. Yeah, you know, what we see the Congress as being hyper-partisan. The Democrats hate what the Republicans are doing. The Republicans hate what the Democrats are doing. But this seems to be an issue that really transcends party politics. This is institutional functioning. You know, where is Congress? Which leads to my next question. What about the third branch? What about the judiciary? Are they going to come in at some point and rein in executive power, or are they going to just sit on the sidelines? Well, I think it's somewhere in between, uh, Richard. I think the judiciary at best can, I say, create speed bumps in the road. Uh, there are so many technical difficulties in getting the judiciary to act in any time frame that's relevant to politics. Uh, that they clearly are not our salvation. Uh, they can do a couple things. Um, you know, they ruled on the subpoenas issued to Trump. He doesn't have absolute immunity. Uh, but in fact, because the House subpoenas have two-year terms, the clock will run out before Trump ever has to respond. It's simply very, very slow. I often remind people it was eight years after Guantanamo Bay opened that the Supreme Court got around to issuing its first ruling you know, on habeas corpus on Guantanamo Bay. You know, that's a long time and is politically irrelevant. Um, and so you can challenge, but they have issues of standing and political question. They don't like to get involved in very, very heated, certainly combat between the Congress and the executive branch. Uh, so that, that is not uh, the branch that's going to, I say, provide salvation from this constitutional dysfunction. It's only the people insisting that Congress stand up and assert itself uh, that is going to correct the situation. And I say, I, I came, Richard, to Washington. My baptism was the height of Watergate. One of my first assignments at the Justice Department was write a monograph on impeachable offenses committed by presidents, which hadn't been examined for a century since Andrew Johnson's impeachment. And at that time, you know, Congress still had real backbone. You had Sam Irvins and Manny Sellers and even Peter Rodino. Um, and the House of Representatives was willing, they were voting an article of impeachment for Nixon's defying one subpoena. That was sufficient. Um, and now, I mean, the president flouts scores of subpoenas and nothing happens or they go to court. In Nixon's case, I know, helped write Article Three, which was the impeachment article for defying a subpoena. It was one subpoena and the Congress said, we don't need to go to court. We have inherent power to enforce our subpoenas and we're throwing you out of office. You don't comply with that. You're interfering with our duties. That's inconceivable that a Congress would do that today. Right. Now, why the deterioration? Now, I don't have an easy explanation, but I, it's, we cannot evade what is clear. If Congress doesn't step up to the bat, there isn't any other institution that can save us. It's not going to be the courts. And so that's why this really is a constitutional crisis. One branch of government, the Congress, is abdicating its responsibility, it sounds like. That is a perfect description of what's going on. And in some respects, it's even more troubling, Richard, that they acknowledge that. I mean, Senator Feinstein of California says, well, why you, you don't want to vote on war? You just let the press, yeah, we don't want to vote on it. If it goes south, we'll complain. But we don't have any fingerprints on war issues because they can be very divisive, right? So they say, yeah, we don't want to vote on it. That's why, and to say, don't make us vote on it. I debate every year, uh, typically John Yu, who was a, a lawyer in the first Bush administration, wrote the torture memo. We debate at the National Defense University. And he described how, when the Iraqi war resolution went up to a vote, that the members were angry, said, why are you making us vote on this? We don't want to vote on anything. We don't want to leave tracks. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to, we don't want to have any accountability for anything. So my attitude, then why are you there? Right. Why do you want to be a member of Congress? You don't want to vote on anything. But that's their, that's their frame of mind, um, is that 
they are gleeful at letting the president act and say, okay, if it goes south, we'll blame him. If, if it succeeds, we'll say, well, okay, no, he's helped our party. Do you have any sense in talking recently since Trump signed these four orders in the past week or so, is there any sense that you get that Congress is starting to wake up and say, hey, you know what, we'd rather not sign, we don't wanna be held accountable, and yet we're really close to going over a serious edge here. We better get our act together. Or are they still continuing to drift away and abdicate? Well, I mean, there's some signs that there have been more statements publicly. Uh, I know Congressman Jamie Raskin, who I work with, uh, who represents the Maryland and is uh, vice chair of the uh, subcommittee on the Constitution. Even Speaker Pelosi called them unconstitutional. Uh, but it's one thing, Richard, to make the statements, but you have to have hearings. You have to educate the public. Ultimately, the public is what's going to determine what Congress does. And it doesn't do a whole lot of good to make one statement in the Wall Street Journal or something. That's the beginning point. The reason why Watergate worked is because we all sat there riveted with the Watergate committee and Sam Irvin and, and even Herman Talmadge, a man's home is his castle. You just can't burglarize Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. That's not what America is. And they were, and, and people listened and we saw the principal characters. We could make our own assessment of the credibility of John Ean, Ehrlichman, John Mitchell. And on the House side, we saw the hearings in the House Judiciary Committee. We heard the arguments that people were educated and they came along and were convinced. That's why the, you know, the government and the people didn't fall apart when Nixon was really compelled to resign because he would be impeached and removed as people felt that they were engaged. That doesn't happen today. Right. I mean, we don't have any, not only hearings on, on impeachable offenses, on all these wars, 10 wars that are, uh, that are run presidential wars, there's surveillance, and nothing happens. There's no Fulbright hearings. And so it's like the Congress isn't, isn't engaging the American people, which they have an obligation to do. After all, we all have a First Amendment right to petition for address of grievances, a very, very important right. Uh, it was what John Quincy Adams relied upon uh, when there were efforts in by House rule to have a, a gag on any abolitionist proposal. It said, wait a minute, they have a right to seek redress of grievances. We, have to, we don't have to comply, but we have to respond. Uh, and I don't know how many times Ralph and I and others have petitioned you know, members writing serious letters, this is what we think has happened to happen. We don't have a right, because we're not elected to have everything we say complied with, but at least the decency of response, we're petitioning. Right. You don't, we're citizens, we pay your salaries, and you have a right to just ignore us, as though what we sent uh, is not worth a scrap of paper. We put a lot of work into this. We're not doing this to harass you. Uh, and that's what Congress has to get back to. They have an obligation to respond to grievances that the American citizens hold. Right. Uh, they don't necessarily have to agree, but they have to be an educated, intelligent response that shows that they've given serious deliberation to the issue. Correct. Now, we have a, an election coming up very shortly. How does the uh, president's recent statements that he's withholding funds from the post office to weaken mail-in ballots, I mean, is that a, yet another example of presidential overreach, or is that just election year politics as normal? Well, it can be both. That's unfortunately, uh, a, a, you know, it, it, and this is what oftentimes is just accepted as, well, it's election year politics, all presidents do it. You know, President Clinton had the Lincoln bedroom uh, sleepovers and Al Gore using his vice presidential office. That doesn't make it acceptable. Um, uh, you know, the government is not to be an instrument of partisan politics. When you're elected, you represent all the people of the United States, not just a particular group or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, but, but here's another example of the, the Congress clearly has its power to appropriate money for the post office to prescribe, you know, the delivery dates or priorities if it wished. It could pass a statute that says that the mail-in ballots must be given priority. And you cannot charge, you know, first class uh, postage for it, or you must make it free. I mean, I, I would think that's exactly what Congress should do. Mm -hmm. Why should you have to pay 
to exercise your right to vote. You know, if because of COVID-19, uh, it becomes very awkward uh, or difficult uh, to vote in person, you'd be able to vote in mail uh, without any penny at all. That's what a democracy is about. Um, and its legitimacy depends upon turnout and people feeling they've been gotten engaged. But why is Congress just sit there and complain and does nothing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if Congress wants to act, they can, but they're choosing not to. Correct. I mean, one of the enumerated powers of Congress, the clearly one, is the power to regulate the post office. You know? <laughs> there isn't any ambiguity. This is a congressional power. Right. Uh, and yet they sit and, okay, the president's going to do this, that, and the other thing to slow down mail-in ballots, and you sit there like a bump on a log? Totally irresponsible. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because we talk, every school child is educated about separation of powers, the executive branch, the congressional or legislative branch, and the judiciary. And they each have their own authority, their own powers. They're all separate but equal. And... Here we see one branch of the government is turning into fog and vapor, disappearing. The Congress is nowhere to be found. It's, it's really troubling. And that, I think, is why it rises to the level of a constitutional crisis. Yeah, it's, yeah Congress is AWOL. We, we can't, the, the Constitution can't work with Congress AWOL. It's yeah. got to be there. And part, part of it is because... You know, for all of its flaws, you know, it's not because members of Congress have a higher morality or philosophy, but Congress represents a greater cross-section of the American people than the president. It forces compromise because one person can't decide everything. And it's far more accessible and approachable and, and, uh, and, and transparent than the executive branches, especially today, not only you know, internally, but even the physical barriers of the executive branch. I keep mounting Lafayette Park, and you remember the president mm -hmm. march over uh, to hold the Bible upside down. It meant mm -hmm. of all people, you know, to be holding the Bible upside down and said, yeah, that looks like the serpent in, uh, in paradise holding up the Bible <laughs> or something, yeah. you know? Well, it's it's not, not, an odd, odd image. Yeah, and the White House is all fenced off now and barriers, barricades, you know, it's a bunker mentality for an imperial presidency. Yeah, yeah exactly. Let me just, just for your audience, Richard, I, when I came to Washington, you could have sign up for tours of the White House in the Rose Garden every day. You could yeah. see lines. You now, outside there on Pennsylvania, there was traffic in front of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. Now, yeah, it does. It looks like a Roman emperor shielded from all of the, the Roman citizens. Right. Well, speaking of that, let's segue gracefully to our second topic, shielding the, the emperor from the citizens. During the run up to and the unleashing of the pandemic in February, since, since February to today's date, President Trump has been, I'm trying to be tactful, wrong more often than he has been not wrong. Originally, he represented that there were 15 cases and it was going to quickly go down to zero, that it was no worse than the flu. Then he made statements touting hydroxychloroquine and then statements about using bleach somehow into the body or light somehow to kill the COVID-19 virus. Has Donald Trump put himself at risk by these false statements for some personal liability to those who have been harmed by what he has said? Uh, it's hard to give a, you know, a, a yes or no answer, which is what everybody always wants. It's, it's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, it's useful to just as background begin with this uh, central U.S. Supreme Court decision called uh, Fitzgerald versus Nixon, mm -hmm. 1982. It was a five to four decision. And there, uh, President Nixon basically had fired Ernie Fitzgerald for testifying for Congress about these crazy cost overruns in building the C-5A. And uh, Fitzgerald then sued the president, claiming that his First Amendment rights, free speech had been violated, among other things. And the court, I believe, in a wrong decision, held that at least for purposes of damages, as opposed to injunctive relief, just saying you can't do it anymore, that a president is absolutely immune from suit for presidential actions. And obviously, the president firing somebody who's part of the Air Force at the time. 
uh, was a presidential action. Um, now, if we assume that Fitzgerald is still good law, uh, it was five to four and it hasn't been overruled since then. It could obviously happen that overruling would occur. Um, the issue is when President Trump, who is not elected and has no responsibilities over treating pandemics um, and statutes don't entrust him uh, with fighting pandemics or giving medical advice, they entrust him with receiving medical advice and he obviously defies it. Uh, are his statements where he basically purports to be a medical doctor and I'm giving you medical advice, is that more in the realm of personal action as opposed to presidential action? Uh, and say, if it's personal, uh, then he would be liable uh, to sue for damages. Just remember, in the Paula Jones case against President Clinton, uh, Paula Jones was permitted to sue him for damages. This was for action that was clearly not presidential because it occurred when he was the governor of Arkansas. This one isn't so clear cut, the hypothetical you've raised, because this action is when Mr. Trump is president of the United States, not pre-presidential action. But the question still is, is this really presidential decision or authority, or is he just going off on his own and say, well, I'm gonna play doctor for the time being. This is what I'm recommending uh, people uh, because he's the president, relying upon it uh, to their disadvantage. Um, uh, but that's for damages. Now, if we just think about um, the possibility of injunctive relief, uh, which is available even if it's for presidential action, uh, you could see that some of the things that he is saying uh, could violate consumer protection laws. It's false and deceptive advertising or misrepresentation. Um, and you could seek to get an injunction against him making any further statements uh, that purport to be based on medical knowledge when he's not a licensed doctor. Mm -hmm. He's basically practicing you know, uh, medicine without a medical license. Uh, and surely the things that he has stated um, as uh, whether they're motivated by political reasons or otherwise, uh, clearly, would constitute a medical malpractice if you're a doctor. For instance, don't need to treat the virus, it'll go away on its own. Well, really, it would be like you showing up at a doctor's office with a fractured bone and the doctor saying, don't worry, the fracture will all heal itself. Or statements, yeah, you'll, you'll just drink this poisonous substance and it'll cure your, uh, your COVID-19 affliction and, and probably kill you in the, uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think it's reckless uh, insofar as he's discouraged by example, the wearing of masks, he's insisting that uh, you know, all the school children go back to school in person, uh, you know, that we start playing football and have these mass events again, which clearly is going to indicate, it's, it's going to cause um, uh, an increase in the number of cases and deaths. We know that simply because many of the states that did uh, relax uh, the restrictions uh, based upon the idea that, well, maybe a COVID-19 will go away on its own or uh, the citizens dislike many of these restrictions. Uh, they're the ones that are now out of control. I mean, Florida being a perfect example. Yeah. Uh, so we know from contemporaneous experience exactly what the results would be if Mr. Trump's recommendations, you know, in his capacity as a doctor were followed. Uh, now you'd have to ask, okay, if this does violate, maybe it would be section five of the Federal Trade Commission Act prohibits unfair or deceptive uh, acts or practices in commerce. Who's gonna have standing to bring the suit? Uh, is it somebody who's died, somebody who's afflicted? Uh, could it be a state attorney general, you know, asserting state consumer uh, laws. Uh, it's a hard question. We do know that in the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision uh, concerning the state of New York investigating uh, Mr. Uh, Trump's uh, taxes, uh, payments for strippers and perhaps loans and insurance, that even though it was an investigation of a state law violation, uh, the Supreme Court held that the president is not absolutely immune from such scrutiny. Uh, so that would militate in favor of concluding, yes, 
if he's violating state consumer protection laws by giving false and fraudulent medical advice, uh, maybe a state attorney general would have stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Well, you know, let the word go forth from this time and place that all lawyers with an interest in this question ought to take a serious look because it is a, a watershed, a huge change in leadership where you have these reckless, unfounded statements coming from the president directed to people who may not know better, advice that's harmful to them. This is really something new and unpleasant to think about. Yes, it's not only uh, you know harmful to those who may rely upon it too, but because of the contagion and the fact that you could be you know COVID nineteen without symptoms, uh, it may end up because you know in some sense we're all at risk if anybody actually is afflicted because the possibility of of uh, infection. Uh, so to the extent that he's caused people to refrain from uh, activity that could keep them free from infection, he's He's, he's making us all uh, more risk. exposed and, and at risk, correct. But I want to, again, go back, uh, Richard, to the earlier issue we had and tie it in to Congress. Congress doesn't have to permit this. I'd actually have drafted a bill and sent to the leadership. It's called the COVID-19 Commission Bill, clearly constitutional, which would have the responsibility for responding to COVID-19 pandemic entrusted to three commissioners appointed by the National Institute of Health Director to serve, you know, during good behavior, if you will, like federal judges. And they would issue the rules and regulations and decrees uh, having nationwide application so we don't have the current balkanized approach with 50 different states doing 50 different things. And <laughs> Congress sits there in a state of stupefaction. Right. They can see this. It seems incredible to me when it's everyone, not everyone, but most everyone sees the lunacy of these medical recommendations out of the White House, and you have it in your power to stop it, and you do nothing. It's like having a life preserver and by the edge of a river bank and seeing someone drowning in the middle of the river and deciding you're not going to throw the life preserver there. Right. You would be viewed as a complete scoundrel. Yes. It's a shocking abdication of their duty as our representatives, the Senate and the House of Representatives, to sit on the sidelines while this madness ravages the land. And the balkanized approach is exactly the wrong approach. This requires a strong, organized, well thought out national approach, which is missing. And Congress must see that, and yet they do nothing. Yeah, it is. I, this is one thing. Richard, I don't think the founding fathers ever conceived that a branch of government would so readily, eagerly surrender their powers. It's not even like Trump has to threaten them. They, get, they give it away voluntarily. Um, uh, and I think part, but not exclusively, uh, the explanation lies in the greater and greater polarization uh, of the parties, uh, where it's just about, hey, you stay on the team, you know, don't fraternize with the enemy. It's not looking at politics as, hey, we want everybody to succeed. And yeah, we can have differences, but in some sense, we're agreed upon the importance of maintaining the integrity of the institution. That is just totally off the radar screen. Mm -hmm. now. And, and the framers couldn't have conceived of that. I think in part because at the time they were drafting the constitution, George Washington was such a dominant figure. There really was not uh, the, the idea of, of having competing parties wasn't there. He was twice uh, received unanimous uh, uh, electoral votes, uh, not a single dissent. Uh, but when he left the scene, the party situation began to emerge, not nearly with the intensity it is today. Um, and, and the framers simply, I'm not blaming them, they obviously focused at the issues that were confronting them in 1787, and George Washington was there, uh, and he suppressed, I think, uh, the tendencies toward factionalism in mm -hmm. politics and caused them to, to overlook this possibility that one branch would completely self-destruct. Yeah, well, it's, it's really troubling because the polarization is the red state, blue state, us versus them. There is no remaining sense or very diminished remaining sense 
of common cause uh, that we're all in this together. It's uh, if we win, they have to lose and yeah. vice versa, whoever we and they are. And, and that's really troubling. And so do you have sitting here in our, the comfort of this uh, remote meeting, what's the, the quick, easy solution? Give me, give me 30 seconds on how we solve this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if I, if I, uh, had an answer, I would certainly not withhold it, but I don't think there is a, a quick and easy solution in part because the problem has been occurring, Not it's not just Mr. Trump, although he perhaps is the culmination. It's been accruing over a long, long decades. Mm -hmm. uh, the abdication, the growing executive power turned into a warfare, security state, surveillance state, crony capitalism state. Um, and ultimately, uh, it may be sound trite, but so insofar as the solution, we have to have citizens who, when they vote, say, I'm not going to vote for a candidate who isn't going to uphold his oath of office. I can't do it. Even mm -hmm. if I think in the short run, it'll come out in my favor if he's not going to exercise responsibility. Uh, that's the only way things are going to change, if you will. Leadership. And, and I mean, one of the things that I had always thought about is if you could try to make the issues we've discussed here paramount in just one election, one electoral, two electoral districts, and you I mean you had a candidate who actually was convinced that these issues that we talked about process are critical and win, you know, everyone would say, hey, this is how you win elections, and they would kind of follow like the herd instinct. But that's difficult. Um, I've often flirted with the idea of even having to try to establish a candidate training school, not for Democrats, for, for anybody, whether you have any party affiliation at all. This is what you need to know about your responsibilities. We now have such a degraded educational system. People graduate, they don't even know what separation of powers. They have no understanding of history. They just think the president has always decided everything because that's what they wake up seeing on TV and seeing on their, their iPhones and everything else. And they don't read history, so they don't understand. No, it wasn't always this way. In fact, the framers would be stunned if they saw the current situation. They, this is not what we created. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is bad. Well, thank you very much for this discussion. It's really very interesting. It's fascinating to me. I will um, get in touch with our video people, and I don't know if this will be done as one or two videos. But, Bruce, thank you very much for talking with me today. This has been really very informative. Yeah, well, thank you, Richard, for inviting me. And you just... Stay safe up there, you know, this COVID-19 will end. But yeah, but you were pointing out, you know, with COVID-19, you get to hear all sorts of people all over the world because no one does be in person anymore, you know? Right. You don't it's have cool. any competition, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Thanks again, Bruce. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, wonderful. Have a wonderful afternoon. You too, bye. Bye-bye.